This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, Part 1, The Telemachade, Episode 1, Telemachus, Part 1. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing-gown ungirdled was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, In Troibo ad Altari Dei. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called out coarsely, Come up, Kitch, come up, you fearful Jesuit. Solemnly he came forward and mounted the round gun-rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding land, and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Dedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, equine in its length, and at the light, untonsured hair, grained and hued like a pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl smartly. Back to barracks, he said sternly. He added in a preacher's tone, For this, O oh dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and owns. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, slow whistle of call, and then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysostomos. Two strong, shrill whistles answered to the call. Thanks, old chap, he cried briskly. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump, shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. The mockery of it, he said gaily. Your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over the parapet laughing to himself. Stephen Dedalus stepped up, followed him wearily halfway, and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl, and lathered cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is observed too, Malachi Mulligan two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the aunt to fork out twenty quid? He laid the brush aside, and laughing with delight, cried, Will he come, the Jejun Jesuit? Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan, Stephen said quietly. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful, he said frankly, a ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English, bursting with money and indigestion. Because he comes from Oxford, you know, Dedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun case? Ah, woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said with energy and growing fear. Out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther. You save men from drowning. I'm not a hero. If he stays on here, I'm off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scutter, he cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Lend us a loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty, crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over his handkerchief, he said, The bard's nose rag. A new art color for our Irish poets. Snot green. You can almost taste it, can't you? 
He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak-pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, isn't the sea what algae calls it? A great sweet mother? The snot-green sea. The scrotum-tightening sea. Epi oinopa ponton. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks. I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata. She is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mailboat clearing the harbour mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his grey searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kitch, when your dying mother asks you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you for her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused, there is something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he murmured to himself, Kitch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care and silence seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow and grazed at the frayed edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain that was not yet pain of love fretted his heart. Silently in a dream she had come to him after her death, her wasted body with its loose brown grave clothes giving off an odor of wax and rosewood, her breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge he saw the sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the muffled voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning and vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. How are the second-hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it, he said contentedly. Second leg they should be. God knows what poxy bosey left them off. I have a lovely pair with a hair striped gray. You look spiffing in them. I'm not joking, Kitch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they're gray. He can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face to the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear green trousers. He folded his razor neatly and then with stroking pulps of fingers felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night, said Buck Mulligan, says you have G.P.I. He's up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman. General paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror a half-circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight, now radiant on the sea. His curling shaven lips laughed, and the edges of his white glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong, well-knit trunk. Look at yourself, he said, you dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out for him, cleft by a crooked crack, hair on an end. And as he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog's body to rid of vermin? It asks me, too. I pinched it out of the skivvy's room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The ant always keeps plain-looking servants for Malachi. Lead him not in temptation and her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban at not seeing his face in a mirror, he said, if Wild were only alive to see you. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, It is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stephen's and walked with him around the tower, his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had thrust them. It's not fair to tease you like that, Kinch, is it? He said kindly. God knows you have more spirit than any of them. 
parried again. He fears the lancet of my art as I fear that of his. The cold steel pen. Cracked looking-glass of a servant. Tell that to the oxy chap downstairs and touch him for a guinea. He's stinking with money and thinks you're not a gentleman. His old fellow made his tin by selling jalop to Zulus or some bloody swindle or other. God, Kinch, if you and I could only work together, we might do something for the island. Hellenize it. Cranley's arm. His arm. And to think of your having to beg for these swine. I'm the only one that knows what you are. Why don't you trust me more? What have you up your nose against me? Is it Haines? If he makes any noise here, I'll bring down Seymour, and we'll give him a ragging worse than we gave Clive Kempthorpe. Young shouts of moneyed voices in Clive Kempthorpe's rooms. Pale faces. They hold their ribs with laughter, one clasping another. Oh, I shall expire. Break the news to her gently, Aubrey. I shall die. With slit ribbons of his shirt, whipping the air, he hops and hobbles around the table with trousers at his heels, chased by aides of Magdalen with the tailor's shears. A scarf-cast face, gilded with marmalade. I don't want to be debagged. Don't you play the giddy ox with me. Shouts from the open window, startling even in the quadrangle. A deaf gardener, apron, masked with Matthew Arnold's face, pushes his mower on the somber lawn, watching narrowly the dancing motes of grass alms. To ourselves, new paganism, omphalos. Let him stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him except at night. Then what is it? Black Mulligan asked impatiently. Cough it up. I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Bray Head that lay on the water like the snout of a sleeping whale. Stephen freed his arm quietly. Do you wish me to tell you? he asked. Yes, what is it? Buck Mulligan answered. I don't remember anything. He looked in Stephen's face as he spoke. A light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair, uncombed hair and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, do you remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quietly and said, What? Where? I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said, and went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked you who was in your room. Yes, Buck Mulligan said. What did I say? I forget. You said, Stephen answered, Oh, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. A flush which made him seem younger and more engaging rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that? he asked. Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death? he asked. Your mother's, or yours, or my own? You saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the Mater and Richmond, and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on the deathbed when she asks you. Why? Because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you. Only it's injected the wrong way. To me it's all a mockery and beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor Sir Peter Teasel and picks buttercups off the quilt. Humor her till it's over. You crossed her last wish in death, and yet you won't sulk with me, because I don't whinge like some hired mute from Lalouette's. Absurd. I suppose I didn't say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, shielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I'm not thinking of the offense to my mother. Of what, then? Buck Mulligan had asked. Of the offense to me, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung around on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. He walked off quickly around the parapet. Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, veiling their sight, and he felt the fever in his cheeks. A voice within the tower called loudly. Are you up there, Mulligan? I'm coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offences? Chuck Loyola, Kitch, and come on down. The Sassanac wants his morning rashers. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. Don't mope over it all day, he said. It's inconsequent. Give up the moody brooding. 
His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed out of the stairhead. And no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery, for Fergus rules the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and further out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light-shod hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea, the twinning stresses two by two, a hand plucking the harp-strings, merging their twinning cords, wave-white wetted towards shimmering in the dim tide. A cloud began to cover the sun slowly, wholly shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay beneath him, a bowl of bitter waters. Fergus's song. I sang it alone in the house, holding down the long, dark chords. Her door was open. She wanted to hear my music. Silent with awe and pity, I went to her bedside. She was crying in her wretched bed. For those words, Stephen, love's bitter mystery. Where now? Her secrets, old feather fans, tasseled dance cards, powdered with musk, a god of amber beads in her locked drawer. A birdcage hung in the sunny windows of her house when she was a girl. She heard old Royce singing in the pantomime of Turco the Terrible, and laughed with others when he sang, I am the boy that can enjoy invisibility. Phantasmal mirth folded away, musk perfumed, and no more turn aside and brood. Folded away in the memory of nature and with her toys. Memories beset his brooding brain. Her glass of water from the kitchen tap where she had approached the sacrament. A cored apple filled with brown sugar, roasting for it the hob on the dark autumn evening. Her shapely fingernails redded by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. In a dream, silently, she had come to him. Her wasted body with its loose grave clothes giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath bent over him with mute secret words, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes staring out of death to shake and bend my soul. On me alone, the ghost candle to light her agony. Ghostly light on a tortured face. Her hoarse loud breath rattling in horror while all prayed on their knees. Her eyes on me to strike me down. Liliata rutilantium te confessorum turma circumdet. Eubilantium te virginum chorus excipiat. Ghoul, chewer of corpses. No, mother. Let me be and let me live. Kinch, ahoy! Buck Mulligan's voice sang from within the tower. It came nearer up the staircase, calling again. Stephen, still trembling at his soul's cry, heard warm running sunlight in the air behind his friendly words. Daedalus, come down like a good mosey. Breakfast is ready. Haynes is apologizing for waking us last night. That's all right. I'm coming, Stephen said, turning. Do, for Jesus' sake, Buck Mulligan said, for my sake and for all of our sakes. His head disappeared and reappeared. I told him your symbol of Irish art. He says it's very clever. Touch him for a quid, will you? A guinea, I mean. I get paid this morning, Stephen said. The school kip, Buck Mulligan said. How much? Four quid? Lend us one. If you want, Stephen said. Four shining sovereigns, Buck Mulligan cried with delight, will have a glorious drunk to astonish the druidy druids. Four omnipotent sovereigns. He flung up his hands and tramped down the stone stairs, singing out the tune with a cockney accent. Oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer, and wine, on coronation, coronation day. Oh, won't we have a merry time, on coronation day. Warm sunshine marrying over the sea. The nickel-shaving bowl shone, forgotten on the parapet. Why should I bring it down? Or leave it there all day? Forgotten friendship? He went over to it, held it in his hands a while, feeling its coolness, smelling the clammy slaver of the lather in which the brush was struck. So I carried the boat of incense then at Clongo's. I am another now, and yet the same. A servant, too. A servant of a servant. In the gloomy domed living room of the tower, Buck Mulligan's gowned form moved briskly to and fro about the hearth, hiding and revealing its yellow glow. Two shafts of daylight fell across the flag floor from the high barbicans, and at the meeting of their rays a cloud of coal smoke and fumes of fried grease floated, turning. "'Well, be choked,' Buck Mulligan said. "'Haynes, open that door, will you?' Stephen laid the shaving bowl in the locker. A tall figure rose from the hammock where it had been sitting, went to the doorway, and pulled open the inner doors. "'Have you the key?' a voice asked. 
Dedalus has it, Buck Mulligan said. Janey, Mac, I'm choked. He howled without looking up from the fire. Kinch! It's in the lock, Stephen said, coming forward. The key scraped round harshly twice, and when the heavy door had been set ajar, welcome light and bright air entered. Haines stood at the doorway, looking out. Stephen hailed his upended valise to the table and sat down to wait. Buck Mulligan tossed the fry on the dish beside him. Then he carried the dish and a large teapot over the table, set them down heavily inside with relief. "'I'm melting,' he said, as the candle remarked, when— "'But hush! Not a word more on that subject. Kinch, wake me up. Bread, butter, honey. Haines, come in. The grub is ready. Oh, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. Where's the sugar? Oh, Jay, there's no milk.' Stephen fetched the loaf and a pot of honey and the butter cooler from the locker. Buck Mulligan sat down in a sudden pet. "'What sort of kip is this?' he said. I told her to come after eight. We can drink it black, Stephen said thirstily. Then there's a lemon in the locker. Oh, damn you and your Paris fads, Buck Mulligan said. I want Sandy Cove milk. Haynes came in from the doorway and said quietly, The woman is coming up with the milk. The blessings of God on you, Buck Mulligan cried, jumping up from his chair. Sit down, pour out the tea there. The sugar is in the bag. Here I can't go fumbling at the damned eggs. He hacked through the fry on the fish and slapped it out in three plates, saying, In nomine patris il fili spiritu sancti. Haines sat down to pour out the tea. I'm giving you two lumps each, he said, but I say, Mulligan, you do make strong tea, don't you? Buck Mulligan, hewing thick slices from the loaf, said in an old woman's wheeling voice, When I makes tea, I makes tea, as M old Mother Grogan said. And when I makes water, I makes water. By Jove, it's tea, Haines said. Buck Mulligan went on hewing and wielding. So I do, Mrs. Cahill, says he. Begob, ma'am, says Mrs. Cahill, God send you don't make them in one pot. He lunged towards his messmates and turned a thick slice of bread impaled on his knife. That's folk, he said very earnestly, for your book, Haines. Five lines of text and ten pages of notes about the folk of the fish gods of Dundrum printed by the weird sisters in the year of the big wind. He turned to Stephen and asked in a fine, puzzled voice, lifting his brows, Can you recall, brother, is Mother Grogan's tea and water pot spoken of in the Mabinogian, or is it in the Upanishads? I doubt it, said Stephen gravely. Do you now? Buck Mulligan said in the same tone. For reasons, Bray? I fancy, Stephen said as he ate, it did not exist in or out of the Mabinogian. Mother Grogan was, one imagines, a kinswoman of Marianne. Buck Mulligan's face smiled with delight. Charming, he said with a finical sweet voice, showing his white teeth and blinking his eyes pleasantly. Do you think she was? Quite charming. Then, suddenly overclouding all his features, he growled in a hoarsened, rasping voice as he hewed again vigorously at the loaf. For old Marianne, she doesn't care a damn, but hising up her petticoats. He crammed his mouth with fry and munched and droned. The doorway was darkened by an entering form. "'The milk, sir.' "'Come in, ma'am,' Mulligan said. "'Kinch, get the jug.' An old woman came forward and stood by Stephen's elbow. "'That's a lovely morning, sir,' she said. "'Glory be to God.' "'To whom?' Mulligan said, glancing at her. "'Ha, ah, to be sure.' Stephen reached back and took the milk jug from the locker. The islanders, Mulligan said to Haynes casually, speak frequently of the collector of prepuces. How much, sir? asked the old woman. A quart, Stephen said. He watched her pour into the measure and thence into the jug rich white milk, not hers, old shrunken pats. She poured again a measure full and a tilly. Old and secret, she had entered from a morning world, maybe a messenger. She praised the goodness of the milk, pouring it out crouching by a patient cow at daybreak in a lush field, a witch on her toadstool, her wrinkled fingers quick at the squirting dugs. They lowed about her whom they knew, do silky cattle, silk of the kine and poor old woman, names given her in old times, a wandering crone, lowly form of an immortal serving her conqueror and her gay betrayer, their common coquin, a messenger from her secret mourning, to serve or to upbraid, whether he could not tell but scorned to beg her favor. "'It is indeed, ma'am,' Buck Mulligan said, pouring milk into their cups. "'Taste it, sir,' she said. He drank at her bidding. 
If we could live on good food like that, he said to her somewhat loudly, we wouldn't have the country full of rotten teeth and rotten guts. Living in a bog swamp, eating cheap food, and the streets paved with dust, horse dung, and consumptive spits. Are you a medical student, sir? the old woman asked. I am, ma'am, Buck Mulligan answered. Look at that now, she said. Stephen listened in a scornful silence. She bows her old head to a voice that speaks to her loudly, her bone setter, her medicine man. Me, she slights. To the voice that will shrive an oil for the grave, all there is of her but her woman's unclean loins of a man's flesh, made not in God's kindness, the serpent's prey. And to the loud voice that now bids her be silent with wandering unsteady eyes. Do you understand what she says? Stephen asks her. Is it French you're talking, sir? The old woman said to Haynes. Haynes spoke to her again in longer speech, confidently. Irish, Buck Mulligan said. Is there Gaelic on you? I thought it was Irish, she said, by the sound of it. Are you from the West, sir? I'm an Englishman, Haynes answered. He's English, Buck Mulligan said, and he thinks we ought to speak Irish in Ireland. Sure we ought to, the old woman said, and I'm ashamed I don't speak the language myself. I'm told it's a grand language by them that knows. Grand is no name for it, said Buck Mulligan. Wonderful entirely. Fill us out some more tea, Kinch. Would you like a cup, ma'am? No, thank you, sir, the old woman said, slipping the ring of the milk can on her forearm and about to go. Haynes said to her, Have you your bill? We'd better pay your mulligan, hadn't we? Stephen filled again the three cups. Bill, sir, she said, halting. Well, it's seven mornings a pint, two pence, is seven twos, is a shilling, and two pence over. And these three mornings, a quart of four pence, is three quarts, is a shilling. That's a shilling and one and two, is two and two, sir. Buck Mulligan sighed, and, having filled his mouth with a crust thickly buttered on both sides, stretched forth his legs and began to search his trouser pockets. "'Pay up and look pleasant,' Haynes said to him, smiling. Stephen filled a third cup, a spoonful of tea colouring faintly the thick, rich milk. Buck Mulligan brought up a floor and twisted round his fingers and cried, "'A miracle!' He passed it along the table towards the old woman, saying, "'Ask nothing more of me, sweet. All I can give you I give.' Stephen laid the coin in her uneager hand. "'We'll owe you two pence,' he said. "'Time enough, sir,' she said, taking the coin. "'Time enough. Good morning, sir.' She curtsied and went out, followed by Buck Mulligan's tender chant. "'Heart of my heart, were it more, more would be laid at your feet.' He turned to Stephen and said, "'Seriously, Dedalus, I'm stony. "'Hurry out to your old school, Kip, and bring us back some money. "'Today the bards must drink and junk it.' Ireland expects that every man this day will do his duty. That reminds me, Haynes said, rising, that I have to visit your national library today. Our swim first, Buck Mulligan said. He turned to Stephen and asked blandly, Is this the day of your monthly wash, Kinch? Then to Haynes, The unclean bard makes a point of washing once a month. All Ireland is washed by the Gulf Stream, Stephen said, as he let honey trickle with a slice of loaf. Haynes, from the corner where he was nodding easily a scarf about the loose collar of his tennis shirt, spoke. I intend to make a collection of your sayings, if you will let me. Speaking to me, they wash and tub and scrub, egg and bite and inwit, conscience, yet here's a spot. That one about the cracked looking-glass of a servant being the symbol of Irish art is deuced good. Buck Mulligan kicked Stephen's foot under the table and said with warmth of tone, Wait till you hear him on Hamlet, Haynes. "'Well, I mean it,' Haynes said, still speaking to Stephen. "'I was just thinking of it when that poor old creature came in. "'Would I make any money by it?' Stephen asked. "'Haynes laughed, and, as he took his soft grey hat from the holdfast of the hammock, said, "'I don't know, I'm sure.' "'He strolled out of the doorway. "'Buck Mulligan bent across to Stephen and said with coarse vigour, "'You put your hoof in it now. "'What did you say that for?' "'Well,' Stephen said, "'the problem is to get money. "'From whom?' From the milkwoman or from him? It's a toss-up, I think. I blow him out about you, Buck Mulligan said, and then you come along with your lousy leer and your gloomy Jesuit jibes. I see little hope, Stephen said, from her or from him. Buck Mulligan sighed tragically and laid his hand on Stephen's arm. From me, Kinch, he said. In a suddenly changed tone, he added, To tell you the God's truth, I think you're right. Damn all else they are good for him. Why don't you play them as I do? To hell with them all. Let us get out of the kip. 
He stood up, gravely ungirdled, and disrobed himself of his gown, saying resignedly, Mulligan is stripped of his garments. He emptied his pockets onto the table. There's your snot rag, he said. And putting on his stiff collar and rebellious tie, he spoke to them, chiding them into his dangling watch-chain. His hands plunged and rummaged in his trunk while he called for a clean handkerchief. God, we'll simply have to dress the character. I want puce gloves and green boots. Contradiction. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. Mercurial Malachi. A limp black missile flew out of his talking hands. And there's your Latin quarter hat, he said. Stephen picked it up and put it on. Haynes called to them from the doorway. Are you coming, you fellows? I'm ready, Buck Mulligan answered, going towards the door. Come out, Kinch. You have eaten all we left, I suppose. Resigned, he passed out with grave words and gait, saying well nigh with sorrow. And going forth, he met Butterfly. Stephen, taking his ash plant from its leaning place, followed them out, and as they went down the ladder, pulled to the slow iron door and locked it. He put the huge key in his inner pocket. At the front of the ladder, Buck Mulligan asked, Did you bring the key? I have it, Stephen said, perceiving them. He walked on. Behind him he heard Buck Mulligan club with his heavy bath towel the leader shoots of ferns and grasses. Bound, sir. How dare you, sir? Haynes asked. Do you pay rent for this tower? Twelve quid, Buck Mulligan said. To the Secretary of State for War, Stephen added over his shoulders. They halted while Haynes surveyed the tower and said at last, Rather bleak in winter time, I would say. Martello, you call it? Billy Pitt had them built, Buck Mulligan said, when the French were on the sea. But ours is the Omphalos. What is your idea of Hamlet? Haynes asked Stephen. No, no, Buck Mulligan shouted in pain. I'm not equal to Thomas Aquinas and my fifty-five reasons he has made out to prop it up. Wait till I have a few pints in me first. He turned to Stephen, saying, as he pulled down neatly the peaks of his primrose waistcoat, You couldn't manage it under three pints, Kinch, could you? It has waited so long, Stephen said listlessly. It can wait longer. You pique my curiosity, Haines said amiably. Is it some paradox? Pooh, Buck Mulligan said. We have grown out of wild and paradoxes. It's quite simple. He proves by algebra that Hamlet's grandson is Shakespeare's grandfather, and that he himself is the ghost of his own father. What? Haines said, beginning to point at Stephen. He himself? Buck Mulligan slung his towel stolewise round his neck, and bending in loose laughter, he said in Stephen's ear, O oh, shade of Kinch the Elder, Japhet in search of a father. We're always tired in the morning, Stephen said to Haines, and it is rather long to tell. Buck Mulligan, walking forward again, raised his hands. The sacred pint alone can unbind the tongue of Daedalus, he said. I mean to say, Haines explained to Stephen as they followed, this tower and these cliffs here remind me somehow of Elsinore. That beetles o'er his base into the sea, isn't it? Buck Mulligan turned suddenly for an instant towards Stephen, but he did not speak. In the bright silent instant Stephen saw his own image in cheap dusty morning between the gay attires. It's a wonderful tale, Haines said, bringing them to a halt again. Eyes, pale as the sea, and the wind had freshened paler, firm and prudent. The sea's ruler, he gazed southward over the bay, empty save for the smoking plume of the mailboat vague on the bright skyline and a sail tacking by the muglins. I read a theological interpretation of it somewhere, he said, bemused. The father and the son idea, the son striving to be atoned with the father. Buck Mulligan at once put on a blithe, broadly smiling face. He looked at them, his well-shaped mouth opened happily, his eyes, from which he had suddenly withdrawn all shrewd sense, blinking with mad gaiety. He moved a doll's head to and fro, the brims of his Panama hat quivering, and began to chant in a quiet, happy, foolish voice. I'm the queerest young fellow that you've ever heard. My mother's a Jew, my father's a bird. With Joseph the joiner I cannot agree. So here's to disciples and cavalry. He held up a forefinger of warning. If anyone thinks that I ain't divine, he'll get no free drinks when I'm making the wine. But have to drink water and wish it were plain that I make when the wine becomes water again. He tugged swiftly at Stephen's ash plant in farewell, and running forward to a brow of the cliff, fluttered his hands at his sides like fins or wings of one about to rise in the air and chanted, Goodbye now, goodbye, 
Write down all I said, and tell Tom, Dick, and Harry I rose from the dead. What's bred in the bone cannot fail me to fly, and all of it's breezy. Good-bye now, good-bye. He capered before them down towards the forty-foot hole, fluttering his wing-like hands, leaping nimbly, Mercury's hat quivering in the fresh wind that bore back to them his brief bird-sweet cries. Haynes, who had been laughing guardedly, walked on beside Stephen and said, We oughtn't to laugh, I suppose. He's rather blasphemous. I'm not a believer myself, that is to say. Still, his gaiety takes the harm out of it somehow, doesn't it? What did he call it? Joseph the Joiner? The Ballad of Joking Jesus, Stephen answered. Oh, Haynes said, you have heard it before. Three times a day after meal, Stephen said dryly. You're not a believer, are you? Haynes asked. I mean, a believer in the narrow sense of the word. Creation from nothing and miracles and a personal God. There's only one sense of the word, it seems to me, Stephen said. Haynes stopped to take out a smooth silver case in which twinkled a green stone. He sprang it open with his thumb and offered it. Thank you, Stephen said, taking a cigarette. Haynes helped himself and snapped the case, too. He put it back in his side pocket and took from his waist pocket a nickel tinder box, sprang it open, too, and, having lit his cigarette, held the flaming spunk towards Stephen in the shell of his hands. Yes, of course, he said, as they went out again. Either you believe or you don't, isn't it? Personally, I couldn't stomach the idea of a personal God. You don't stand for that, I suppose. You beholden me, Stephen said with grim displeasure, a horrible example of free thought. He walked on, waiting to be spoken to, trailing his ash plant by his side. Its ferule followed lightly on the path, squealing at his heels. My familiar, after me calling, Stephen, a wavering line along the path. They will walk on it tonight, coming here in the dark. He wants that key. It's mine. I paid the rent. Now I ate his salt bread. Give him the key, too, all. He will ask for it. That was in his eyes. After all, Haynes began, Stephen turned and saw the cold gaze which had measured him was not all unkind. After all, I should think you are able to free yourself. You are your own master, it seems to me. I am a servant of two masters, Stephen said, an English and an Italian. Italian? Haynes said. A crazy queen, old and jealous, kneel down before me. And a third, Stephen said, there is, who wants me for odd jobs. Italian? Haynes said again. What do you mean? The Imperial British State, Stephen answered, his color rising in the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. Haynes detached from his underlip some fibers of tobacco before he spoke. I can quite understand that, he said calmly. An Irishman must think like that, I dare say. We feel in England that we have treated you rather unfairly. It seems history is to blame. The proud, potent titles clanged over Stephen's memory, the triumph of their brazen bells. Et unum sanctum catholicum et apostolicum ecclesium. The slow growth and the change of rite and dogma like his own rare thoughts. A chemistry of stars. Symbols of the apostles in the mass for Pope Marcellus. The voices blended, singing alone, loud in affirmation. And behind their chant, the vigilant angel of the church, militant disarmed, and menaced her heresy arcs. A horde of heresies fleeing with mitres awry, Photius and the brood of mockers of whom Mulligan was one, and Arius, warring his life long upon the consubstantiality of the Son and the Father, and Valentine spurning Christ's serene body, and the subtle African heresy arc Sibelius, who held that the Father was himself his own son. Words Mulligan had spoken a moment since in mockery and to the stranger. Idle mockery. The void awaits, surely, all them that weave the wind. A menace, a disarming and a worsening from those embattled angels of the church, Michael's host, who defend forever in the hour of conflict with their lances and their shields. Hear, hear! Prolonged applause. Zut, nom de Dieu! Of course I'm a Britisher, Haines' voices said, and I feel as one. I don't want to see my country fall into the hands of the German Jews, either. That's our national problem, I'm afraid, just now. Two men stood at the verge of the cliff, watching. Businessmen, boatmen. She's making for Bullock Harbor. The boatman nodded towards the north of the bay with some disdain. There's five fathoms out there, he said. I'd be swept up that way when the tide comes in about one. It's nine days today. 
the men that was drowned, a sail veering about the blank bay waiting for a stolen bundle to bob up, roll over to the sun a puffy face salt white. Here I am. They followed the winding path down the creek. Buck Mulligan stood on a stone, in shirt sleeves, his unclipped tie rippling over his shoulder. A young man, clinging to a spur of a rock near him, moved slowly, frog-wise, his green legs in the deep jelly of the water. Is your brother with you, Malachi? Down in Westmeath, with the Bannons. Still there? I got a card from Bannon. Says he found a sweet young thing down there. Photo girl, he calls her. Snapshot, eh? Brief exposure. Buck Mulligan sat down to unlace his boots. An elderly man shot up near the spur of rock, a blowing red face. He scrambled up by the stones, water glistening on his pate and on his garland of his gray hair, water reeling over his chest and paunch and spilling jets out of his black sagging loincloth. Buck Mulligan made way for him to scramble past, and glancing at Haynes and Stephen crossed himself piously with his thumbnail at brow and lips and breastbone. Seymour's back in town, the young man said, grasping again his spur of rock. Chucked medicine and going in for the army. Ah, go to God, Buck Mulligan said. Going over next week to stew. You know that red Carlisle girl, Lily? Yes. Spooning with him last night on the pier. The father is wrought with money. Is she up the pole? Better ask Seymour that. Seymour, a bleeding officer, Buck Mulligan said. He nodded to himself as he drew off his trousers and stood up, saying tritely, Red-headed woman, buck like goats. He broke off an alarm, feeling his side under the flapping shirt. My twelfth rib is gone, he cried. I am the Ubermensch, toothless kinch, and I, the supermen. He struggled out of his shirt and flung it behind him to where his clothes lay. Are you going in there, Malachi? Yes, make room in the bed. The young man shoved himself backwards through the water and reached the middle of the creek in two long, clean strokes. Haines sat down on a stone, smoking. Are you not coming in? Buck Mulligan asked. Uh, later on, Haines said. Not on my breakfast. Stephen turned away. I'm going, Mulligan, he said. Give us that key, Kinch, Buck Mulligan said, to keep my chemise flat. Stephen handed him the key. Buck Mulligan laid it across his heaped clothes. And two pence, he said, for a pint. Throw it here. Stephen threw two pennies on the soft heap. Dressing, undressing. Buck Mulligan erect, with joined hands before him, said solemnly, He who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord. Thus spake Zarathustra. His plump body plunged. We'll see you again, Haines said, turning as Stephen walked up the path and smiling at wild Irish. Horn of a bull, hoof of a horse, smile of a Saxon. The ship, Buck Mulligan cried, half twelve. Good, Stephen said. He walked along the upward curving path. Liliata rutilantium turma circumdet, ubiolantium t virginium. The priest's gray nimbus in a niche where he dressed discreetly. I will not sleep here to-night. Home also I cannot go. A voice, sweetened and sustained, called him from the sea. Turning the curve, he waved his hand. It called again. A sleek brown head. A seal's. Far out on the water. Round. Usurper.